another chilly morning in Sacramento, California. But I just got back from Temple Coffee. Anyway, I apologize for starting so early today. Uh, but Bob Fisher is, is driving up from Oakland uh, to take my picture uh, today. And I have a lot of stuff that uh, I have to do first. Uh, not the least of which is trying to get presentable to be photographed. So uh, this morning, I'm going to uh, uh, read you a little story, a fanciful story, an imaginary story of when Abraham the Jew in Egypt met Abramelin the mage. Okay, it's a famous moment in occult history. And I sort of reimagined how, how it might be uh, as part of uh, my uh, uh, screenplay that I had to turn into a novel so it uh, could be re uh, uh, <laughs> returned uh, to a screenplay. Now, obviously, the movie has... Uh, uh, never been made, but it has reached uh, 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 certain milestones of, of uh, uh, production over the years, but we'll probably never, never see it. But, but you can read the story, and uh, it was done with the help of my good friend James Britkowski, who is uh, sort of the cinematic uh, uh, expert. And it's called Aleister Crowley, Revolt of the Magicians. And it's a novel, of course. And uh, uh, it's just... Actually have it converted to uh, a novel so it could be adapted. Uh, uh, oh, it's a long story. Anyway, thought I'd share that with you this morning uh, because it's kind of cool. I think, anyway. So, kind of picture the scene there. It's a it's a flashback within the within the the movie about Aleister Crowley, but uh, it's a flashback of where Abraham the Jew, uh, of course, is seeking out the, the the secrets of the sacred magic, and he finds himself traveling all around the, uh, 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 Europe and the Middle East. And he finally hears about this character, Abraham, or, or Abramel and the maids that lives out uh, in the Egyptian desert. And uh, so uh, we find uh, uh, Abraham the Jew alone on a camel, okay, uh, walking across sand dunes and things like that. And and uh, as he approaches at sunset, uh, uh, this this one particular sand dune, uh, demons appear. Four demons appear, and he sort of gets off his camel and and uh, uh, clumsily, but technically uh, accurately, clumsily uh, uh, tries to banish them. Okay, uh, they. Uh, uh, he does banish them, and the four demons actually turn into sort of beautiful uh, humanoid uh, 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 creatures that then serve as his escort. And these four creatures escort him over the sand dune to where he's about to meet Abrabel and the mage. The camera rises over the backs of Abraham and the warrior spirits. What we see now is the model of paradise, ancient, towering date palms, outlining a large, irregular-shaped pool of rippling water. It reflects the blood-red rays of the fading sun. To the right of the pool, sheltered by palm and rose trees, stands a small but richly appointed tent, illuminated from within. The old man stands at the door of the tent, flanked by what first appears to be two children. 
Abraham and his demon escort, stop a few yards from the pool. He gazes for a moment at the scene, then proceeds to brush off the dust of his travels and ordeals. When he again looks up, he discovers his escort has disappeared. He catches a glimpse of four large insects scurrying into the grass near the pool. We now get a closer look at the old man. He's rather short. His light robe is belted with a living serpent. His long gray beard is immaculately braided in seven braids. The two servants at his side are not children, but miniature adults with fine features and warm pink complexions. Abraham approaches the tent and then stands directly in front of the old man. He bows and makes the customary gestures expected from a guest. The servants offer him the customary bread and salt. After Abraham eats, the old man parts the veil of the tent door and gestures for Abraham to enter. The scene fades to black and then fades back into the interior of the tent. The interior walls of the tent are de decorated to give the illusion of a starry night in the desert. Abraham and the old man are seated upon beautiful on a beautiful carpet which magically hovers several feet off the floor. They each hold a cup of wine. Their conversation takes place first in ancient Egyptian with subtitles. The old man begins. You call yourself Abraham Ben Simeon from Worms a city in Germania. That is correct, sir. How did... Words are spirits, Abraham of Worms. Choose them wisely. They can serve you or eat your soul. Abraham respectfully tries to come to the point of his visit. I have traveled for three years in order to the old man raises his hand to hush Abraham. No, boy, you've traveled farther than that. I'm sure you're mistaken, sir. I, I left Germania in the spring of 1402, as the Christians reckon. It is now. It is always now. You've traveled three years from the past and 400 years from the future. Forgive me, sir, I... You seek Abraham the magician. Well, you have found me. Abraham is visible. I, I hope I read that correctly. You seek Abramelon the magician. Well, you have found me. Abraham is visibly relieved. I want to learn the sacred magic. Abraham, or excuse me, Abramelin lifts his cup and takes a healthy swallow of wine. I cannot teach you that. Someone else must do that. Someone else? Who? Someone you've not met yet. You. I don't understand. Abraham squirms a bit causing a wave that disturbs the serenity of the floating carpet. Nor will you ever understand, Abramelin says coldly. Then, Master, what must I do? The old man stops the undulations of the carpet with a wave of his hand. Ask not what you must do, boy, but who you must become. Young Abraham is visibly frustrated and confused. Master, I, I am most sincere. I would use the magic only for good. 
At these words, Abramelin laughed so loud that the serpent that serves as his belt is disturbed and momentarily releases its tail from its mouth and circles the old man's waist before once again reattaching itself. Good? You would use the magic only for good, would you? He leans over and wraps his knuckles on Abraham's forehead as if knocking on a door. My young friend, you are not awake enough to know when you are doing good and when you are doing evil. Abramelin sits back and chuckles as he drains his cup. Abraham silently empties his. He looks confused and dejected. He stares into his uh, empty cup. Taking pity on the young man, Abramelin reaches his hand over and flicks the cup lightly with his fingernail, and the cup miraculously fills with wine. The camera angle now is looking down from young Abraham's point of view, and Abramelin is looking directly at us as we slowly move in toward the old man's eyes. Abramelin's voice becomes soft and hypnotic. Okay, this is being... Uh, this section is being uh, dictated in the, within the context of the story. Uh, but you'd have to read that yourself. I'll continue with uh, Abramelin's words. Hear me, Abraham of Worms. Half your soul is asleep and dreams it is a man. The other half is awake and dreams it is a god. Awake, boy, and unite your soul. Only then will you be a magician. And when you are a magician, everything you do is magic. Abraham looks deep into his wine cup and seems hypnotized by the reflection of his own eyes. Without looking up, he asks, And what do you call this real me who is awake? Abramelin whispers his answer. It will tell you its name. A more perfect and radiant image of Abraham's face is now reflected in the wine cup, giving us the impression of an angelic glorious and perfected Abraham, trying to meld with the dull, mortal Abraham. Then the old man adds, Until then, think of it as your holy guardian angel, for that is indeed who it is. Abraham looks up from the vision in his cup and gazes into the wise and radiant face of Abramelin the magician. Master, if you will not teach me the sacred magic, then I pray you, teach me to awake. As Abraham speaks, the entire set, the tent, trees, oasis, spring, everything dissolves into thin air. The two men are alone, under the star-filled desert sky. Nothing remains but the carpet they are sitting on, which is now hovering about three feet above the sand. Abramelin smiles and says matter-of-factly, Right, then let us begin. Suddenly the carpet disappears. Abramelin remains seated, suspended in the air, Abraham falls painfully to the ground, creating a small cloud of dust that transforms into swirling snow and ice flakes shot against the backdrop of the black abyss 
of the crevasse of ice where Crowley is lying unconscious in, on a mountain. <laughs> anyway, we are back on the Baltaro Glacier and Crowley lying semi-conscious on the ice ledge. He hallucinates that he hears the voice of Abramelin. It simply says, awake, boy. Okay, that's our Monday uh, uh, offering. I have to get going. Constance has to make a big order uh, from uh, uh, Swanson Supplements. <laughs> she needs the phone. So until uh, tomorrow, and tomorrow, uh, who knows if I have to start early or late or something, but uh, I'll probably be uh, uh, broadcasting from the car tomorrow. So until tomorrow, continue to be good to yourself and be good to each other. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Love is the law. Love under will.